ready? Yep. All right. Welcome to the Patriots Lament Show. We, uh, the first hour, the wake up call. Uh, we have a very special guest today we want to get right to. His name is Dr. Gary North. He is with the Ron Paul curriculum. He was Ron Paul's original staff economist, and if you read lourockwell.com daily, you can see his writings there quite a bit, um, or at the Tea Party Economist and Specific Answers. So we want to go right to him. Mr. North, are you there? Yes. Great. Thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. My son is doing backflips, actually, right now. That's good. <laughs> you are very popular in our household. Um, we wanted to have you come on today to talk about the Ron Paul curriculum and to go over the 26 reasons to adopt the Ron Paul curriculum. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about, in my family, just real quick, the... Um, it was really... Homeschooling, obviously, is, I think, what most parents... Well, every parent should do if they're able to and get their children out of the public school system. But there's not a lot, or there's maybe too many options. And I never was very happy with any of the options that we had as far as homeschooling curriculum. So first of all, can you ta tell us why should people, parents, get their kids out of the public si school system if they aren't so inclined to right now? Well, I think the fundamental rule on any of these educational issues is the old phrase, which is accurate, and that is one size does not fit all. So parents know pretty early in the game that various children, even within the family, have different capacities, different interests, different skills and commitments. And if you send a child into what I would regard as a cookie-cutter system of education where it's designed, maybe not for the lowest common denominator, I don't think that's fair, but certainly at the middle end of the competence of the whole body of students on the campus, then you know that in some of the classes, unless it's a very advanced school, that your child is going to get shortchanged in something. And I think if you can gear the curriculum to what you think is good for the children, then I, I think it's a better strategy. Now, I'm a great believer in competition, mm. and I think there should be multiple homeschool programs out there because the skills and interests of the children are different. And the tough thing for the parent is to find a good series of courses and materials for a whole family that will work with the whole family, but won't drive the parent crazy in trying to teach multiple tracks and multiple strategies to the children, because most parents aren't going to be in a position to do that. So you have to decide overall for the kids in general which of the available curriculum programs probably would be the best fit. And then in certain classes where you know a child is either way ahead or way behind, then you have to alter the teaching or the materials for that one child in that one course. Wow. So when, uh, so how did, how did you come about to come with the, curriculum that you came up with what with dr paul what what was uh i think reason number one on your 26 reasons to have it i think is my, the best reason why i liked it my family and i i was a member of the liberty classroom with tom woods and we listened to yeah, that. that's a good program yes very good program we would listen to that as a family and uh, i love the historical stuff and the uh Western civilization, but I think that your reason number one is the most important for me anyways of why I wanted to use the Ron Paul curriculum, and that was, just to quote, it says, this curriculum helps you pass on your most important inheritance, your worldview. So Correct. along those lines, tell us what is the worldview of the Ron Paul curriculum in general? Well, the worldview of the Ron Paul curriculum might be called libertarianism, but it goes back 
to a man by the name of Leonard E. Reed. Mm. And Reed created the first, what we would call, think tank. It was a nonprofit educational foundation immediately after World War II. It was called the Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE. And some people knew it by its address, which was Irvington-on-Hudson, New York. And Reed operated that for about 10 years, and then he launched a magazine called The Freeman. And that magazine was the primary tool of recruitment into the limited government or limited state philosophy. And The Freeman was the tool by which a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people, were first introduced to the writings of Ludwig von Mises and Henry Hazlitt and F.A. Hayek. These were Austrian school economists primarily. And Ron Paul was influenced by the Freeman very early. So was I. I first started reading it when I was in high school. Hmm. And then I later went on staff with the Freeman, or at least with Fee, in the early 1970s, as a senior staff member, I had written for the organization for about five years. So the freedom philosophy is what Leonard Reed called it. He did write a book, pretty good book, if you can find a copy. I think you, maybe it's online, I like to believe it is, called Elements of Libertarian Leadership. And he was one of the early people to use that word. However, in later years, he tended not to use it as much. He just called it the freedom philosophy. That's what Ron Paul calls it. And I've used it for over 40 years because that's what Reed called it. But the basic position is that individuals are responsible for their own actions, that families are the primary means of social welfare and social insurance in a society, and that the function of civil government is to reinforce the laws against theft and violence, murder, and uh, deception, in other words, fraud, legal fraud, and that the state's function is to protect people from violence and fraud and to let them alone in those other areas of life so that creative people can come up with creative ideas. Now, this is a comprehensive philosophy, a limited government philosophy, limited civil government, not limited government because there's family government, there's church government, there's individual self-government, but with respect to the state, then you don't want the state constantly interfering because people become dependent on the wealth transfers of the state, and they lose their freedom. So we call it the freedom philosophy. I teach half of the government class, and I use many of the books that were published by Fee. But the main one, if you want one book to say, okay, what is it really all about? And it's not very long. You go online and you type in the law. It's by Bastia, it's B-A-S-T-I-A-T, Frederick Bastia, the law. And that pretty well explains what the basic worldview of the curriculum is about, that individuals are take, should take the responsibility for their actions, and the state's function is not wealth redistribution, but protection against violence and fraud. That is actually one of the things, Israel, if you want to... Say something about that. He he uh, actually told me that he enjoyed going through Basia in the in the government course the most. Is that right, Israel? Hold on, gotta get your mic. Is your mic on? Yeah, uh, go. Ahead. You go ahead. Tell him. Tell him who Israel is. Israel is my fifteen-year-old son. I I think the switch is up. Oh, they're just having problems here. Israel, use mine. Israel's my 15-year-old son. He's been doing the course now for four or five months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about what you're doing. Well, um, yeah, I, I did enjoy the, the, um, all the classes on Frederick Bastiat. Um, 
I think、um, one of the most interesting lessons was、um, the one on Frederick Bastiat's broken window fallacy.、Um, that that actually fascinated me a lot because I had never I had never thought of anything like that before, and、um, I think it's very interesting having having something something like that just shoved right into your brain so you can just think think about it. Um, contemplate go, go over that. Ex- over. Why don't you e- explain it to the listeners what that broken window philosophy is? Well, I think a big part of the the broken window fallacy is is the concept of seeing the unseen and something that you keep coming back to, um, quite frequ- frequently in the in the courses is seeing the unseen. So. So, say say if there's a there's a man in a village who owns a bakery, and a thug comes through the town and breaks the window with a stone of the bakery. Now all the townspeople gather around the bakery and start arguing about what this means. And、um, most of the people in the town think that it's a bad thing that the The window was broken, obviously, but there is one man in the crowd that says to the farmer, "But doesn't this stimulate the economy? Because now that the window is broken, the baker will have to go to the glassmaker to repair a new window, and the glassmaker will use that money used in his business to pay for your farm." Pay for the products from your farm, and so then、uh, obviously this causes a stir in the crowd, and the the farmer sees this point of view. But then the baker comes around again and says, "But what if the the window had not been broken in the first place? What if the window hadn't been broken in the first place? Where would the money have gone? It's it, the."、Uh, The baker would have used that money on something else, like a new suit from the tailor, and then the tailor would have used the money that he got from the bank baker to pay for the crops from the farm. So it it doesn't really matter where you look at it. It's it's all about it's all about who's losing, who's losing.、Um, Where is the money going? You always have to look at where the money is going. So, in in this concept, in this in 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 this、uh, broken window fallacy, the the、um, the baker is losing, but he's losing the window that he has to repair, and then once it's repaired, he lost the money that he spent on the repairs. But now the glassmaker. Now the glassmaker is obviously getting good business from this, but it was it was gained by someone else breaking someone else's personal property, which is you know already somebody's losing. So it's just it it I think of it as always looking at the unseen things. Like no nobody will nobody will look at that concept, and、uh, I think I think a big part of that is as soon as as soon as I heard it, I thought, well, that kind of makes sense, you know, that stimulates the economy. Whoop de do the、um, the the farmer is still selling his crops, the farmer is still getting good business, but it's still.、Um, There's still somebody losing in in the that, concept. That that is the that's the essence of it, and the heart of it is it was not the first choice of the baker to spend it on glass. He wanted to buy the suit, and so the whole chain of events goes from glass into the economy. But the baker is a loser. Because he didn't want violence against him, what he wanted was to buy the suit. 
And so you've seen the logic of it, and once you see the logic of it as it applies to broken glass, you find that the same logic applies across the board to every act of violence against property. That it's not just the broken glass, but it applies everywhere. And that was Bastiat's genius. He came up with that example, and once you understand it, then wherever you look, where the individual is the victim of violence, whether it's by the state or by a private individual, you know there's a loser. And the loser is the poor guy against whom the violence was committed. So that's a very good example. That's why we start with that example, that classic example of the broken window. And it's also in Fred in uh, Henry Hazlitt's book on economics in one lesson, he starts with that same example because it's such a powerful one. So you do get the idea. Now what you'll find, and for the listener, all right, you've, you've heard a student explain a concept which is not understood or believed by Keynesian economists or by government politicians who keep running massive deficits and keep hiking taxes. So they don't understand it. But once you do understand it, then it's going to apply to government, it's going to apply to economic theory, it's going to apply to any area of life in which violence is brought against an individual. So that is the freedom philosophy. It's a good example. And so what we do is to take that outlook and that uh, broken window fallacy, and we apply it to the history of Western civilization. We apply it to American history. We apply it to the history of the American Constitution, that the goal is to liberate men from oppression and violence in order to free up their creativity so that they do whatever they think they're responsible to do, and presumably they do it with greater enthusiasm than when somebody sticks a gun in their back and tells them to do something. So that basically is the philosophy. That's a, it's a good example. That's where we do start it in the class on civil government. It is an, a philosophy that applies across the boards. Now, for those parents who do understand this and who are concerned about the expansion of the state into every area of our lives, those parents are looking for a curriculum that is consistent with what they believe. And this curriculum is the only one that I am aware of that's available in a comprehensive way that takes this position of the freedom philosophy and applies it to the academic disciplines. Now, of course, I don't think it applies. I mean, we don't have a course in physics that, uh, that is dependent on it. The physics class is based on physics and chemistry, too. But if you're talking about social theory, if you're talking about the humanities, if you're talking about history and literature, then we do apply this in the history of literature so that the students can understand the relationship between the development of history, at least Western civilization, and the development of literature. So I teach a two-year course from the Hebrews to the present in literature, and this course parallels Dr. Tom Woods' course on the history of Western civilization, so that there's feedback between the course on the history of literature and the course on the history of civilization. So the student is shown that this philosophy does apply not just to government, but to every area of life, including literature. Can I ask a question about that? I've had... Uh... People comment to me before, I'm, I love history and world history, Western civilization, and we talk about that a great deal on this program, and people off and on have said, oh, you guys focus too much on what happened in the past. Who cares about that stuff? And could you just speak on that for a minute? Why is it important to understand Western civilization? In, I mean, like you just said, you go all the way back to Hebrews, to the Hebrews, and I sat in with the kids on the during the Western civilization, just to compare it to the Liberty Classroom one, and it's it's awesome. It's really good. But could you tell us why it's important to understand these things from so long ago and how it affects us today? 
I mean, why, sh- why should people have their well, kids the, learning those things? The basic issue is cause and effect. We want to know why it is that in our day, Western civilization has generally been triumphant throughout the world, because that wasn't true 500 years ago, 800 years ago, 2,000 years ago. The civilization has developed over time. If there are central principles that undergird this civilization, and we abandon those principles on the basis of political issues, on the basis of philosophical issues, and we abandon them, then we can lose the gains which we have made. And so the students need to know Where did the idea come from with respect to personal self-responsibility? Where did the idea come from that people have rights of ownership that should not be interfered with by either the state or by thieves? If private property is central to the development of Western civilization, then it would be a mistake not to show how the private property idea was responsible for the development of the institutions, the customs, and the legal systems that made possible the world in which we live. On the other hand, if there are rival positions that constantly reduce our liberties, increase our burden in terms of what we owe to the state, if these rival philosophies consistently produce civilizations that fail, that do not expand economically, that do not give liberty of conscience to people, and so forth, then we ought to see cause and effect that those systems don't work. Well, we've had this opportunity. We had it. And it began visibly in the October Revolution of the Soviet Union, which established the Soviet Union um, in 1917. And we know when it ended, and it was December of 1991. It was a 74-year experiment in tyranny. And in China, it lasted even a shorter period of time. It lasted from 1949 until approximately 1979, and then it was reversed. Hmm. So if we have examples in history of a failure, a monumental failure across an entire nation or an entire civilization, and it goes belly up in bankruptcy, then the student has evidence to say, not only is this philosophy of limited government legitimate, but it has very definite cause and effect aspects to it in history in which people live better lives with greater liberty, greater wealth, greater choices available to them, precisely because the system of civil government restricted the intervention of the state into the lives of the citizens. So you have to have evidence. You can't just say, well, it sounds like a good idea, because somebody's going to say, who says? Basically, there are two questions in life, and it applies, certainly it applies in, in, uh, in business, and it applies in academics. The first question is, so what? And the second question is, who says? And what we want to do with this philosophy and this curriculum is to say, there's an answer to the question, so what? And it leads to liberty and prosperity and freedom. And there's an answer to the question, who says? So you go back to the primary source documents of Western civilization and literature, and you begin to trace them to show that these principles, when applied in society, were able to produce the civilization which has brought us all of these benefits. And if students aren't trained to do this, then they can be easily deceived by slick politicians who want to expand the power of the state and take away the liberties of the citizenry. I think that's probably a, the biggest contrast between the Ron Paul curriculum versus a public school, where you have public school teaching children that all these wonderful things happen, all this progress and 
and wealth was gained th- because of the state versus the Ron Paul curriculum showing, proving that these things came about from freedom. Right. Well, that's that's certainly what we're attempting to do as best we can. The public schools, now, you have to say, the pu- I don't think the public schools are run by a bunch of communists. Because <laughs> communism is floating face down and has been for almost a quarter of a century. But what you have is the mixed government philosophy. We call it Keynesianism in economics, and we call it, I guess, the Great Society or the New Deal or the Fair Deal in American politics. But they're basically the same system. And that system is the government doesn't own the means of production, but it sticks a gun in your belly and it tells you what you are allowed to do with your means of production. And so the state does it indirectly, not by ownership, which it would have been in communism, but by regulation, taxation, and inflation. Those are the three killers. Regulation, taxation, and inflation. That is how the state directs the economy against the wishes of the individuals who would have done something else with their money. So we're back to the broken window. And the state's got three stones that it tosses through the window. And the stones are regulation, taxation, and inflation. And we are the losers in that proposition. I know that um, when Israel, for instance, first um, realized what inflation was, he said, Dad, that's, that's a tax, just a hidden tax on us, just another way to tax us out of our earnings, out of our wealth. In a way that most people, I'd say probably 90% of the people in America don't even understand that. Yeah, that well, that that's the function of it. But that is, it's a more convenient way to extract wealth out of people. And you do it, you don't do it with a gun. People know when a gun's pointed out and the guy says, hand over your money. <laughs> that's pretty obvious what's going on. But when the state, by means of the Federal Reserve System, debases the money and debases your purchasing power and spends the money, it doesn't have to take it out of your wallet. It takes it out of the banking system, spends it first, takes your wealth, and leaves you with whatever is left over. And people don't perceive that that's a means of taxation. So they don't stick a gun in your belly so it's more subtle. And people don't really perceive that this is what is going on, but it is what is going on. Do you guys, does does the curriculum go over the uh, Federal Reserve in particular? Well, that will be done in two classes. I will be teaching the American history class, so we'll talk about the development of central banking in the United States. And it's a political question as to how that was pulled off. It was one of the remarkable stunts in American history, but it wasn't the first one because it was done two times before. It was done with the first bank of the United States in uh, in 1791, and then it was done again in 1816, and the third time was 1913. So we'll be covering all three of the central banks. Now, there will be a class in the 12th grade. Of course, you, know, you, you can take it whenever you want. We don't believe much in grade, mm-hmm. except except math. I mean, we understand you better you better do math progressively. That we understand, but the rest of it is not necessarily contiguous. You don't have to have one class to get into another class. And in the senior year, there'll be the economics class, which will cover central banking and fractional reserve banking as an economic phenomenon. But we probably won't be talking all that much about the political background to it, because that will be covered in the American history class. Hmm. With um, what you just said about not necessarily following a grade level, except for in math, which does make sense, is that uh, is that a philosophy that the Ron Paul curriculum follows, where it's just yes, I think we yeah, it is it's, okay. Yeah, it is a specific philosophy. Now, look, we're not dummies. At least I'm not a dummy. I know about marketing. (laughs) 
So if people want to talk about grade level, I'm sure going to talk about grade level because that's what they want to talk about. But the reality is different students have different talents and they develop these talents at different ages. And so if you've got a student who's a whiz at, say, biology, but he's having trouble with chemistry, well, then we would say have the biology class first. But there'll, there'll be some kids, it's the reverse. But some kid will say he can handle the chemistry. Somebody maybe gave him a chemistry set when he was 11 or 12 years old, and he's good at it, and he likes it. And he's not very good, at least not yet, at biology. Well, in that case, we'd say let him have the chemistry class first. Let him prove himself, let him get confidence about himself with the class that he likes, and then take the tougher class later on. Now, you can't do that with math, but you can do it with the other classes. For example, we have English classes. Well, the freshman class is a class on autobiographies, and we study classic autobiographies to show students how to write and how to read critically all leading to the final week, and the final week is we want you to write your autobiography. We want kids to, to begin to write their own autobiography. Well, now, you could take that in the senior year. You don't have to take it that in any particular year, and it's not a prerequisite to take the history of literature. So it just depends what the parent believes is best for a particular child at a particular age. And that would uh, obviously lead to a lot less frustration on the child's part if he's able to go at his pace and and the things that he struggles with, he can take his time with, and the things that he understands and gets and loves, he can just excel in those areas. And That's right. That's right. And when, as a matter of fact, at the end of next year with the complete course is finished and everything's done, we're going to give an option, and that is have the student take one class for six weeks and nothing else, hmm. and then take a CLEP or AP exam and quiz out of the whole thing for college, thereby saving the parent about three to 4000 bucks per class. Because we believe that every student is capable of graduating from the Ron Paul curriculum and going into the junior year of college, thereby skipping two years of expenses in college, and thereby skipping the indoctrination that is always given on the campuses of colleges during the first two years. Hmm. So we figure we can cut the cost of college for the family by at least 40% and maybe more, which could be depending on what college you send the child to, anywhere from 30000 to $60,000 per student. In fact, one of, the, one of the teachers that we have is a young man 20 years old. As his birthday present to himself for his 18th birthday, his present was a bachelor's degree in business from an accredited college and the whole thing cost him 12 grand and he paid for it at 18 he finished college hmm. <laughs> now that's the way to do it he was homeschooled of course and there are parents out there who are going to write checks to universities anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 after tax dollars who didn't need to spend a dime on that education if that parent had enrolled his student in the Ron Paul curriculum. That's fantastic. Could yeah. Could we talk a little bit about um, one of the things I've been impressed with with the curriculum is money management, which uh, yeah. I think is great. And also, um, I'm not sure exactly what the course was called, but it basically was teaching a child to start and run his own business. Those might be yeah. in the same class, but personal finance. No, they're, it, it's different. Okay. The finance class, we call that a ninth grade class, but in fact, if a student's got the money and the gift, it probably ought to be about a seventh grade class or eighth grade class. And it's on personal finance. 
and it's on all aspects of finance as it applies to teenagers. But of course, the parents ought to be taking that class. <laughs> parents say, "Oh well, I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> don't kid yourself." Maybe there's some parents out there who don't need it, but I'll tell you, most parents do need it. And it's on budgeting. It's on time management. It's on investing. It's on how to take, how to see what debt can do to you negatively. It's about missing the landmines that are set for us at about the age of 14 or 15, and that we don't get through that landmine field until we're about 80. <laughs> and that landmine out there, that field blows people's, uh, what I would call their, blows off their fiscal limbs on a regular basis. And some kids get so buried in college debt that they never get out. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to immunize the students against debt and to show them alternative uses of their money. Now that, we, we, that starts, I, yeah, we say ninth grade. It starts whenever the parent thinks the child is ready. The business class, though, we have three tracks in the Ron Paul curriculum. They start in the junior year. And the three tracks are natural science, social science and humanities, and home business. And different students will want different tracks, and different parents will prefer different tracks for different students, depending on their abilities. Now, if a student is willing to skip the summer vacation and take full year program, 12 months a year, then he can cover all three tracks before he graduates. Now, I think that's the best way to do it, but I don't think parents should tell the student, look, you're, you got to give up your summer vacation unless there's a benefit to it, because his, his peers aren't doing it. There may be resentment. Now, if there's benefits, like you get out, of, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you more money to go to college, we'll help you start a business, if you'll just take it every every month and not take summer vacation, there'll be some benefit to it. Then the student can make his decision. And I think that's the best decision. But the home business, the program, that generally starts in the junior year. What we call the junior year, in other words, at that point when the student makes his decision, do I want to go natural science, social science, or business? Is it important to, uh, let's just say some parents are going to look into the Ron Paul curriculum, is it important, do you recommend that they look over it with their students, with their children, have them have some feedback in what they're interested in, or is, oh, that, yeah. is that important? Oh, sure. Look, let's not kid ourselves, okay? Everybody knows this. As soon as a kid hits 13 or 14, the kid can derail anything the parent wants to divide. The kid just says, no, I ain't going to do it. The parent can't do a thing about that. You can impose sanctions. You can yell. You can plead. You can roll on the floor and hold your breath until you turn blue. But if the kid says, I'm not going to do it, he's not going to do it if he's willing to suffer the consequences. No, most kids aren't going to do that. But he can do it. So you ought to work with the student. You want the student to give it his all. And that's one of the things we recommend. We don't recommend that any student go into this thing without, from the very beginning, and, uh, signing basically a contract that says, I'm going to give this thing my best shot. Because hmm. if the student isn't behind it, then we don't think it can work. This is a self-taught curriculum. Let me, under, let me get this across. Right. Parents don't do anything. Or, well, they can read the term papers. They can read the weekly papers. They don't have to, but they probably should. First, maybe they know better grammar. And secondly, that over a period of time, the parent will see that the child is improving. And that's important. By the way, the student will see in a year or two or three that he is improving. 
But this is a self-taught curriculum. This is done through videos, through readings, through simple examinations, and a weekly writing assignment in the humanities and social science classes. So the student does it. The student decides when he's going to watch it and listen to it, when he's going to turn in the paper. The student decides, i got to listen to this again, and he rewinds it. Of course, we don't rewind it. What's He backs it up. I'm going, I'm back to uh, tape technology. So rewinding is the wrong word, but whatever it is means back it up and watch it again till he gets it. And the parent doesn't do any of this. The parent doesn't have to pay for textbooks. There aren't any textbooks. It's all online reading. So once the student is in, the sixth grade on, the parent can simply back off and say, you're on your own. I wish you the best. (laughs) And in fact, that's the best way to do it. And the parent can look at the exams, or he basically what he does, he looks at the reading assignments. And if the kid has got his act together, he takes CLEP exams or AP exams, and the exam, he's going to pass that exam. And by the way, we guarantee that if you take one of the CLEP classes that we have, if the kid doesn't pass the exam, we give the money back for the exam and the course. So it's a zero-risk proposition for the family if the student takes one of our classes on how to pass the exams. Okay, so the risk goes out of it. Now, if the kid passes the exam, and he almost certainly will, now he's got college credit. Well, does the parent think that's good enough? Look, if the kid can pass a college class and save the parent two grand in doing so, I think the parent should be happy. Happy, 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 as, as we learn on Duck Dynasty. Old, old Phil Robertson says, happy, 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 and a parent who saved $60,000 in college tuition and room, room and board, that's happy, happy, happy. Definitely. And I, and I think it's a good point what you're making here. One of the reasons that we hear from parents most off, often is, um, well, I don't feel adequate to teach my children or I don't have time to teach my children. You know, there's plenty of excuses and some of it's legitimate, but I think that uh, it's important to point out with the Ron Paul curriculum that this, you don't have to quote unquote, teach your children these courses. They teach themselves. They learn on their own. You have, let's see, you know, you've got three little babies and you have your older kids that need to learn school. You can, they can do the Ron Paul curriculum while you're taking care of your little children. This allows the, the student to go on his own and learn on his own. Yeah, that, that was the deliberate design for it, because we think that when the kid hits college, parents not going to be there to nag him. <laughs> and let me tell you, the, the professors do not care. Oh, man, they do not care. They don't want to hold hands for the student, pat them on the head, call them twice a week to say, how are you doing? They're not going to do that. So the kid hits college, and he sinks if he does not have self-discipline and the skills of studying. I mean, you throw your kid into college where you have played helicopter hovering over him or her academically, and then goes to college? Well second semester, the the kid's coming back with F. That doesn't pay. The student has to, you, you, look, parents, you've got to decide when to cut the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to do it eventually one way or the other, unless the kid is a special ed kid and you need professional care. If you're talking normal kid, go to college. Normal kid, start a business. Normal kid, go out and get a job. You got to cut the umbilical cord. Now, different age group for different students. One size doesn't fit all. And that age is not going to be specified in advance for each student because it's going to vary student for student. What's the best way to find out? Put the student in a self teaching curriculum and then see how he does. And if the kid thinks, Don't nag the kid. Stop the nagging. Just do another curriculum. Go find something else. Go buy different texts. Do something else. 
But if your child doesn't need to be nagged, get off his back, give him his reins, and let him ride off into the sunset as fast as he can go. Because you want him to be an adult quick, (laughs) with an adult's ability to make judgments. That's what we need for students. That's what everybody needs, the ability to make good judgments. And you don't learn that if you're going to hover. If you're, A student doesn't learn that with a hovering parent. And at some age, you've got to say, i got to back off. I don't think it's smart to hover, hover, hover until the kid is 18, and then he goes to college and he gets the dorm key, okay? The dorm key key transition. It's a, it's like baptism or something. Mm-hmm. The kid gets the dorm key, and the parent walks out the door, and it's over. And you don't know what's going to happen in that dorm, except you can guess. And the child had better not be a child at that stage, because that dorm key ritual is one of the most risky decisions in all of modern life. And parent better know that that kid's available in terms of good judgment to uh, to make that decision. It'll, along with this uh, curriculum, you know, we're we've been talking about the freedom philosophy, and I think uh, this is a, an important point to bring up too. This this curriculum also teach your child to to not only understand the freedom philosophy, but also teach them to defend it also, won't it? Yes, we have a speech class. That's yes. Very yes. good. That starts, again, I'm not telling you what grade, but it's in the ninth grade segment, but you could start it at eighth. So the child learns public speaking. We have not a requirement. The parents are in charge, but we suggest that each child sets up a YouTube channel. And then the child goes through the speech class, and what he does then is he produces his YouTube videos, he gives his speeches, those go online, he can share those with other students, he can share them with the parents. The parent knows that the child is not flaking around because there are all these speeches online that he's given. Now, we also recommend that they set up a blog site, probably WordPress, and then for the speech class, the student embeds on a page the YouTube video that he produces for his speech class. So he has a record of what he's doing. Now, along comes a truant officer. Now, there are not many truant officers anymore. But let's say a truant officer finally does show up at the door. What are you doing with your kid? Oh, I'll show you. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Johnny, and he brings Johnny in because the parent doesn't know. He may have seen it, but he's not running it. And he says, show this man what you got. Well, okay, what class do you want, Mr. Truant Officer? What do you, what do you want? Do you want Do you want the English class? Oh, yeah, I've got essays. Yeah, we've got 30 essays or 40 essays. Do you want to read them? They're posted on my website. In fact, all of my written assignments are posted on the website. So you take, what do you want to see, Mr. Truant Officer? Oh, yeah, how are you doing in math? Well, I passed a CLEP exam and I got college credit. Does that qualify? (laughs) I mean, what's the guy going to say? The kid passes a Western Civilization test for advanced placement or CLEP. He's gotten full college credit. You think that truant officer is going to say, no, no, I don't think you've met the standards for our high school district. No, he's going to go away. He's got other fish to fry. And the student can simply go through his website right there for the truant officer. What do you want to see? That's how we recommend that students do it. That's fantastic. I like that analogy. (laughs) Well, we're starting to – how much time do we have, Bob? Got about six minutes. Oh, that'll give us enough time. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if you would talk to us about your uh, your government course, the cons- the about the U.S. Constitution, about constitutions. Yeah, that that course begins on the twenty third of June. 
Mm-hmm. That course is taught by Tom Woods. And what he will do in that class, I've seen the outline for it, he's going to go through the major decisions of the courts, the Supreme Court. Inevitably, that is where these issues are settled. But he's also going to give the political background as to why the court did it and when the court did it, and to show that that relates to developments of politics and developments of philosophy, social philosophy, racial philosophy, economic philosophy in the society, and then this results in a Supreme Court decision that either reinforces the trend or breaks with the trend, so that it won't simply be a course in constitutional law as such, it will be a course in the development of the Constitution from the very beginning to show how it has evolved alongside the development of essentially political commitments, political outlook in the United States that ultimately the court is going to reflect that perspective. And so it will be a one-year course in how the Constitution was hijacked. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what it is. How did the Constitution get hijacked? And that, and so I don't know anybody else who can teach that any better than Dr. Woods. No, he is a fantastic teacher. He just, I love listening to him, watching his videos. He's so easy to understand and follow. Yes. Yeah, he has that gift. I'm hoping. But he knows his stuff. I mean, he does know his stuff. There's no question about it. I'm hoping you guys will quit working him so hard sometime soon so I can have him back on the radio show. Every time I ask him, he says, oh, no, they're working me too hard. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, this, we, don't, we did not have time. You see, here was, the, for the reader or the listener, here's the deal. Look, Ron Paul, while he was in Congress, couldn't do any of this. Yeah. Because there were rules, and I think legitimate rules, in terms of congressional ethics, that you don't use your congressional slot to make money on the side. And I think that's a legitimate restriction. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't do any of this stuff until he was out of Congress. So then he he wrote the the book on education, and that appeared last year. And so the Ron Paul curriculum did not go officially online until early April, of 2013, and we've had to bootstrap it from virtually nothing since the early months of 2013, because he he wasn't allowed to do any of this until he was out of Congress. So we're we're playing catch up. Yep. I do I do two or three um, lessons a day for my classes. Today was exceptional. I did. I had to do five of them this morning. Five, four classes, four classes this morning, uh, finishing up the uh, class in autobiographies. So we're hustle, of course, and then he has his, his Liberty campus, and I do uh, the uh, GaryNorth.com. I have to write four articles a day, six days a week, plus two or three extras for the Ron Paul site, plus two or three lessons a day for the kids. So we're all pushing it. Well, Mr. North, we're running right down to the end. We thank you so all much right. for coming on. If you would give your uh, contact information, how people get on to uh, the Ron Paul curriculum. On our blog, we have a link to your curriculum also, but just give us some information about yourself before we run out of time. Well, just, just type in ronpaulcurriculum.com or search Google for Ron Paul Curriculum. It'll be the top thing you find. Take a look. You can see the classes. You can have sample courses. You can read all the facts. Basically, it boils down to this. There's a money-back guarantee if in the first two months your child doesn't like a course or doesn't like the program, you get all your money back. How so can you it's beat a that? no-risk it's a no-risk deal monetarily. Now, there's risk for time because the kid has to commit, but there's no risk for your money. Can't beat that. All righty, sir. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and hopefully we can have you on again sometime soon. 
Well, that's good. Thanks for inviting me, and I hope parents will uh, take a look at the site. Absolutely. Have a good day. Bye. Right. All right, man, that was fantastic. So we had, What about your info? Oh, yeah. PatriotsLament.blogspot.com is the website, and uh, like I said, the Ron Paul curriculum is on there. You just click it. It'll go straight to it. Don't forget the uh, YouTube channel at uh, Radio Free Fairbanks. And thanks for listening. There's no hour two today because they're going to do their spring auction. Gary North said he'd be on for two hours. Does that mean an hour? Station does. All right. Anyways, see you all next week. Don't touch that dial. 